thanks very much, Michael. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Jin Dong Ju uh, from uh, Shanghai University um, of Finance and Economics. He's going to talk about the new normal of global trade uh, and hopefully have some encouraging words. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great, great pleasure to be here. I thank the uh, Mehdi uh, invited me. Uh, so, so uh, indeed, it's it's a very interesting time to discuss uh, this international trade, particularly to discuss this uh, relationship between uh, China and the U.S. Uh, well. Certainly, so I, I guess the idea would be that I would be the second speaker, right? So then I can, I can have different uh, opinions or different understandings uh, from the another side, right? So that's 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 the uh, uh, my task. Uh, so certainly there would be different understanding uh, from different uh, uh, perspective. So so. Uh, uh, I'm going to discuss uh, my understanding. Uh, so let me just uh, let me just say a few words, and uh, uh, I will be extremely uh, happy and welcome the comments, uh, critique, uh, disagree. What is the on, on my understanding? Oh, yeah. So that be so. It's it's a it's it's a it's a place and to provide different understanding and discussion and exchange ideas on this. Uh, a very important relation. Okay, so I call new normal of global trade and a new framework of global economic governance. Uh, yeah, that, that's so. I, I actually I changed. It, I revised a little bit last night. Is that new? What? Well, let me just go, keep going. Okay, so it's a project ongoing with the, uh, my my co-authors and uh, Sean Jing is is from the Columbia University and then these. Uh, also the uh, uh, other team. Okay, so so we we try to discuss three things. One, how do we understand global trade? We call new norm of global trade. Second of all, we try to how to understand uh, what is uh, the new idea or new architecture of global governance. That's the second question. The third. What would be what would it be big picture for China's uh, trade? So that's three questions we would like to uh, investigate. Okay, so here is the message uh, I would I would present. Uh, the first thing, so, uh, this one doesn't work. Yeah. Okay, new normal of global trade. So here is our our understanding. We we think this is the old normal. Rapid growth, U.S. dominant, and China driven. So that's a three uh, called old normal. Uh, we we would think that's that's the area. That's the that's the time period before 2012. And then we think switch to a new normal called slow down in growth, tripolar world, or you can say it's, it's a multipolar world, and a block structure. So that would be a new normal. So I'm going to explain, so why do we think so? Then we propose called G3, uh, called New Framework Global Economic Governance. We, we, uh, there are several possibilities. So one possibility would be still uh, G1, which we call G1, G7. So it's still US lead to uh, the, the, the global governance, which US attempts to win, as, at least our understanding is, U.S. Uh, the President Obama attempts to uh, restore, or G2, uh, which here G2, some people uh, propose it's U.S.-China, uh, uh, which we I we think it's kind of uh, there are similarities U.S.-China uh, between U.S.-China and uh, for the American Soviet confrontation. So we, we would like to, to uh, avoid so. So instead, we propose a G3 which based on the data set, which indicate is NAFTA, EU, and one, and also Asia, a deeper uh, integration in Asia, which we call either lunar community, or Asia community, or Huasha community. Uh, I, I'm going to explain why, why we call, call that. Okay, so that, that would be, and this, this uh, multipolar, or at least at least the G3 polar stretch of global governance, we think it's more stable, 
and it calls for more uh, cooperation surrounding confrontations. And also, it's more realistic. And we, we, that, that's the uh, uh, global governance uh, we suggest. So. And then, the uh, new uh, the strategy or the big picture for China's uh, trade, China's openness, uh, I guess you guys know it's, it's two wings, one belt, one road. But a one belt, one road only take about 20, 25% of China's trade. So it's, it's, uh, it's not a major uh, part of China's trade. And we think that would be a one belt, one road plus uh, this, this the community, the Asia community or lunar community. That would be another 25%. And then the the 15% to European Union, 15% to uh, North America. That would take the big picture of China's trade. So that's, that's basically uh, three uh, part of my presentations. Uh, so so let, let me just move on, and I'm, I'm going to explain, and also, uh, I, I guess, so uh, what I will discuss. So what, what do we mean this called new normal? So I think people know these days. Uh, here, this blue line is, is the trade growth. This red line is the GDP. So you can think, so you people, uh, from to, before 2012, the, trade, uh, the growth rate of trade is about double of the, G, of the world trade, GDP growth. However, after 2012, this uh, trade growth is below GDP growth. And the last year was a 13%, 30% 6 uh, uh, of, the, of the reduction, decrease of the trade growth last year. I'm not sure this year, but it, it, it's not the number as well. And China is a strong uh, trade country, also had a reduction, 8% reduction in trade growth. This year, again, is that year. So, uh, looks like we are going to a trade crisis. Last year is 30%. This year is, we still had 10% decrease, and then we are heading to a really, really big trade uh, trade crisis. So that's the slope, yeah. So what actually we want to understand what should, what actually is going on? Why we have a, have a, 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 a so so such a deep, a deep decrease in trade growth? Uh, you can explain that it's a cyclical. Or it's a new state. We think that behind this uh, this number, this this, this uh, global growth slowdown, there are structure change. Because of the structure change, so we think we, we, we now we are in a new model. So what structure change? Okay. Here it's so so we here is a growth. Let me just move on. So I, I have I think this. Uh, all the normal is called U.S. lead and China driven. So why do you think it's a U.S. lead? Let's let's look at the 1980 or 2000. In 2000, U.S. it's the number one world largest country in trade, which takes about 15 percent, 15.5 percent of the world trade. Germany is about eight, and Japan is about 6.5 percent of the world trade. So U.S. not only is the number one largest country, it's, it is more than some of the second largest one and the third largest one. So clearly U.S. is it's, uh, definitely the, the, the largest trade country in that time. At the same time, so here numbers shows how many countries take U.S. as the largest trade partner. So out of 168 country, uh, countries, which in our data set, uh, there were 47 countries taking U.S. as the largest uh, trade partner. And Germany was 22, and France is about uh, uh, 20. So again, U.S. had uh, uh, most countries took uh, U.S. as the largest trade partner. So if you use 2000 number, clearly U.S. is the key, is the core countries, or leading countries uh, in the world trade system. So we call U.S. lead or U.S. dominant system. But this number clearly changed until 2012. Or if you look at 2015, now China is the largest uh, trade country, which is about 12%, and the U.S. is still about 11.5%. 11, 11 and Germany is 717 So it's, it's a change from U.S. Uh, late system 
two, I, at least it shows, uh, that it shows a kind of a three polar system. Okay, so here, it's Asia, uh, America, and Germany, and Europe, and Europe. So that would be uh, our first uh, argument. So the uh, trade structure actually changed. So that's the first problem that is. Also, so here we say it's a slow down in growth, try now the old normal is a rapid growth, US dominated, and the China driven. I'm going to explain why it is a China driven. Oh, sorry, I don't mind putting this in your uh, Sorry. So, so you might, so you, that doesn't hear me. Yes, it's good. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so this is, uh, well, this is much better. Uh, so I can, I can slow down. Well, it's a rapid growth, US dominate and China driven. That's, that's the old normal and the new normal we call slow down in growth, tripolar world order and a block structured. Why do we call this block structured? Okay, so now let me move, move on while we think it's a block structured. Oops. So what, what's Okay, so here it's, uh, it's the, uh, the, the diagram that we draw. This is the top 30, uh, top 30 uh, countries in trade. And uh, the lines represent, what, do, what the lines means? Okay, here is a line. This is a Thailand. Line means Thailand take Japan as the largest trade partners. That's line means. If I have a thick line, which means U.S. take the U.S. is the largest largest trade partner of Canada, and Canada is the largest uh, largest uh, partner of of the U.S. That is actually the, uh, the several people in OECD reports and other people they bought wing all have the similar uh, uh, data set. The trade actually is regional. Okay, so the, it's it's not that global. It's, it's regional. If we look at Europe in 1995 in Europe. Almost all, actually all countries, all European countries take the European, another European countries as, as the largest trade partners. And Germany was the, clearly was the, was the lead country, or core countries, or you can case the, case the key countries in the, in the, uh, uh, in the European uh, Union, European. And, the German, and the Japan was, was the key uh, trade countries in the uh, Asia, uh, in Asia. And USA is, is the key country in the, uh, in the uh, America. However, the largest trade countries in, in Asia, Japan, Korea, India, all took US as the largest trade partner. So you can see clearly Asia Pacific and North America is actually, actually connected, right? So US is not only the, the, the key countries or, or uh, dominant country, trade countries in the America, it's also dominant the, the countries in the Asia Pacific. So you can see there were actually two uh, value chains, European value chains and Asia Pacific, Pacific value chain in 1995. But it changed. You can see 2014. Now, the uh, European, European is still regional trade. And here, America doesn't change that much. But in Asia, there, there, were, there are big change. The first change is, is not Japan, now China. China replaced Japan as a leading uh, trade country in China, uh, in the Asia. And now less, well, so only China take the US as the largest trade partners. All Asia countries take China as the largest trade, trade, trade country, large trade partner. And the, the China also uh, depends on dependence of the China on U.S. market, it's less and less, uh, it's weak. So it, is, it starts to show there are three regional trade uh, block or three, uh, the, uh, we call uh, uh, value, value chain. So European value chain is here, American value chain is here, and Asian value chains start to show up. So we also, so that's, let me summarize, and the, this, this data pattern shows uh, it's a global value chain, kind of a switch to a regional value chain. So it's what so we call block structured. So that's the three uh, patterns uh, we, we uh, actually see in the data pattern. Okay, so why do we see that? So here I have four reasons. I explain why do we see that. Uh, IMF, I think IMF has a report, OEC, the uh, real reports, indicate 
the recent trade slowed down is mainly due to the capital the, uh, for FDI, uh, the uh, investment slowdown. I, I kind of uh, puzzling because both investment and trade are endogenous. Uh, how can, can you use one endogenous variable to explain mm -hmm. another endogenous variable? So I, I guess we, we can move more exogenous variables and see, uh, see which, what's, the, what's the reason why we call, we have this kind of, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, why we, we have this, this, this structure change. Here I summarize four reasons. First of all, First reason, it's a low cost of labor in developing countries enter into the world production system, particularly China. China, in past 20 years, China has about 20, 200 to 300 million unskilled laborers. And moving from the rural area to urban area, enter into production, the global production systems. So that's why we see, I, I think, it's a US lead and a China driven. And if you remember, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we were arguing outsourcing all, man, all the uh, manufacturers moving from the US to China, right? That's because China has the clear advantage in low skill labor. So this is a huge, huge number of the low cost labor in China getting into the uh, world of product systems. That's the number one reason for the, the old well, it's not really old, well, it's the last wave. Well, I'm not sure it's the last wave. It's, a, it's, the, it's the wave of the uh, second wave of globalization, right? The second wave of globalization. Second of all, second reason is a sharp drop in trade cost brought by technical progress, like the, from the 60s or 70s in container shipping or transportation technology. We, so people, if people go to China, you can see the infrastructure, highway, this, taking a really strong progress in the past 20 years. So that's, just, that's a technology uh, 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 progress. The third one will be the reduction of the institutional trade cost. Precisely because this second wave of globalization are in the interest of the US and China. Until recently, until the five years, late, probably at least two or three years, the people in the US start to claim actually globalization hurts the working people in the US. But that's not the case in 15 years, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, right? The major, majority, at least the academic and government, most of people think the second wave of globalization is a benefit, benefits US and China. So, at least in uh, the in past 20 years, the US and China actually are in the same direction of the interests. They work together to push this second wave of globalizations. So the reduction, that's the reason why uh, we think in WTO and uh, these uh, tariff reductions are, are actually are taking place. But, so, and so the third one will be the rapid growth of a trade in intermediate goods promoted by vertical division of the production. This is, we call global value chain, right? It's a global value chain and which actually, this is a, this is a vertical specialization and also promoted this, uh, this, uh, this uh, 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 the, uh, rapid growth of a trade. So I think that's, a, that's a, mainly uh, four reasons why we see the second wave of globalization. But, if you really look at these four reasons of, of the globalizations, everything changed, everything changed. First of all, low skill labor in developing countries in China, no longer there, no longer there. Well, we still have a, a large amount of excess supply of the labor, low skill labor in India, in Africa. But, uh, but uh, excess supply of labor turned the excess supply of uh, unskilled labor into efficient supply of labor. It's, it's a different story, it's a different story. We, 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 we do not know whether the, the unskilled labor in Africa, in India, will turn into the efficient uh, supply. So we don't know yet. Second of all, this, this technology progress, now the technology progress, it's, it's the internet, it's the intellectual uh, 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 manufacturing. Internet has two, two different, two side effects on the trade. On the one side, well, there be communication cost is lower. On the other side, many trade is no longer necessary. You don't, if for the conference, you don't need it to uh, uh, trade across the borders. And that's a big thing, the reduction in institution trade costs. The interest between China, US, India, Japan, now it's different. 
Doha round negotiation doesn't go anywhere. So the, there is no clear consensus of the, of the similar interests between the major trade countries. So the, the reduction of the induction cost, it's, it's already stopped. And then, as I, I argue, this the global value chain now kind of go to the, go to the, become the regional value chain. So all forces actually changed. All forces actually changed. So that's the, I argue, there are structure change. Because of this structure change, we will see there's a slowdown in trade growth. It's not really a cyclical. Probably it will be a new normal. That's why I call it a new normal, okay? So that's the first part of my uh, 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 research. We see it's, it's new normal. Well, I only have about ten, uh, five to 10 minutes. Let me just quickly go to the second part. So here are several things. There's a low skill cost labor. We don't have much to do with that. Uh, technology cha change, we don't have much to do that. Uh, global value chain to regional value chain, we don't have much to do that. Only thing we, I think we can do is institution traded costs. Whether we can find a, a, a mechanism which uh, US, China, Japan, and European can work together and to reduce, further reduce the trade cost, which we clearly call global governance. Okay, so then here is a global governance. Well, so global go governance, we, we think so like here it is, I propose global governance from the G1, G2, 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 G2 G1, to G3. Let me, let me uh, clearly jump, jump to uh, the G3, tripolar world order, because I don't have much time on, on the, uh, I only have uh, much time on that. Let, let me just quickly jump into, uh, uh, so, okay, so here one interesting uh, phenomenon things, we, see, we have a NAFTA here, we also have a EU here. But in East Asia, uh, there are different trade uh, agreements, but there are no such a deep trade integration like NAFTA and EU. And precisely because different countries have a, have a different uh, uh, interests and US, China and Japan doesn't work, do not work together. And uh, so, so I, so then what, what can we do? Uh, here we propose one thing. Uh, so we propose in order to establish uh, effective global economic governance, China should act as the first mover to boost trade integrations. If uh, new government uh, in U.S. would uh, keep going to promote uh, uh, globalization. That'd be great. China would, uh, it's, uh, can work with uh, U.S. And if European wanted to move on, China, it, it would be great. However, uh, political uh, reality and, uh, may make it difficult for these major countries to, uh, to work together. Even if, even if that's the case, we would think it is the clearly the interest, global interest, and it is in the reality of China. China should move on. China should move on, take the lead for the, maybe we, I can call the third wave of globalizations, and to push uh, more trade openness, even if other major countries do not uh, uh, make it uh, work together. So, we, so that's the, uh, I, I think the, that's the we uh, propose. But how do we do, how can we do that? Uh, we propose, we start from uh, China and, uh, and the neighboring countries to form uh, uh, US, the NAFTA-like or EU-like kind of a deep trade integrations, which we call, uh, call either Washa community or Lunar community. Why we call this or Asia community? So here is the uh, puzzling. Here is a one import, uh, interesting uh, 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 reality. In East Asia or Asia, if we require similar political regimes to be a condition to form a trade integration, we cannot go anywhere. China has different uh, political regime than uh, Korea, than Japan. And we now have a, has a different clarity. So if you require the uh, market system, a democracy system as a condition for trade integration, now nah, you don't go anywhere. So instead of this uh, uh, political system or, uh, uh, or economic system, we go to culture connections. So we, so we can call either Asia value 
or uh, the ancient Russia is an ancient Chinese name of a, a Chinese culture. But if you don't do not like, well, that's too much of China, right? Uh, so it's an Asian uh, culture name. Why don't we call lunar? Well, lunar community. So uh, ma many of the uh, countries in Asia actually use lunar can uh, calendar. Actually, I presented in Singapore, in Japan. People call, well, don't call lunar community. Why don't we, we call chopsticks community, right? <laughs> or soy sauce community. It's OK. It's OK, right? Uh, it's a lunar community because Japan doesn't use a lunar community, but Japan uses, uses chopsticks. So if, the, if I use a chopsticks community, which, which would include uh, 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 Japan, and in Singapore, Singapore said, well, no, no, no. Singapore is like an Asian community because uh, the former uh, leader, Yi Guang, Li Guangyao, actually uh, called for China uh, value. I think that's OK. So we don't, we don't go for political system. We just go, go for culture connections. And what name you, you like, we can, go, we can go Russia, probably Chinese people would like, or call lunar community, or call Asian community. Uh, uh, here, I, I propose, uh, probably you don't Nine countries from the from the data set, you can see here it's China, Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan, South Korea, Mongolia, North Korea, Singapore, Vietnam, Japan, and or yeah, five minutes. Yeah, uh, you can add more. So you can add more. But uh, here, let me just give the clear message. The clear message is number one: it is in the reality. Also, it is in the interest. Uh, global interests, also in the real, political rela reality of China. China should move on. No matter major other major countries will work with us or do not work with us to further globalization, further economic integrations, uh, integration. But start from Asia, start from neighbor countries, and go to cultural connections rather than political regime similarities but it, because it does not go anywhere. And you call Asia value, Russia community, chopstick community, <laughs> soy sauce community. It doesn't, does not matter. Does not matter, right? And then it will give us a tripolar uh, global governance: European Union, NAFTA, and Asia community or lunar community. That, if China take this leadership, then other countries like U.S. will feel feel pressure, right? We will go, go for globalizing, whatever you, you guys do. And then there will be competition in globalization and corporations rather than confrontations. And that probably will be, uh, have, we will have a future for, the, uh, for the, glo the third wave of globalizations. And that, if I call, uh, if TPPP goes through, great. If TPP doesn't go through, we'll take our uh, 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 proposal of the, of the integrations in China. So then leave you guys more time to, uh, to, uh, to discuss. I, I, I guess that, that would, would be uh, uh, our proposal. Let me, let me uh, uh, clearly, uh, I have one minute. That is the uh, research and purpose clearly before uh, the election day. So we, we did not consider uh, Trump, President Trump effect, but we think that's that, that uh, kind of uh, uh, data pattern and, uh, and uh, the global governance of what is in, in the uh, uh, maximize the, social, uh, the uh, welfare of the world. And uh, uh, so last sentence, so kind of last sentence. Yeah. <coughs> So then what's the big picture for China's trade? Well, uh, we have heard a lot of one bed, one road. One bed, one road is about 25% of uh, uh, China's trade. And then Russia or lunar community or Asia community will take about uh, uh, another 25%. EU is 15%, NAFTA is 15%, Japan is about 7%. That would be the, major, uh, the, the big picture for China's trade. So, the, the, so then the, our suggestion or proposal it would be China should push very hard to move along, along in the Asia community. And Asia community to try to have more uh, deep integrations in the Asia. And uh, uh, then hopefully EU will join us and the U.S., will, the NAFTA will join us to, to, to push another wave of globalization. So let me, let me just stop here. Thank you.